a wonderful welcome. We'll just give a couple of seconds to people to join. And while we have some more people to join, I wanted to make you aware of that this Ask the Pro series is powered by the Coffee Technicians program. Um, so if you're interested in developing your skills of, as a coffee technician, you should definitely check out the SEA Coffee Technicians program. It's an education program for new and ex experienced technicians alike. And there's available basically three levels. It's foundation, intermediate, and professional. And there's also all three levels in six modules. Um, there are coffee machines, hydraulics, electrical, water, and preventive maintenance, operations management, and coffee preparation. So if you're interested in learning more, becoming a better technician, and furthering education, you can learn more at sea.coffee forward slash coffee tech. That's sea.coffee forward slash coffee tech. And now enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Caleb Leach, and I'm welcome to Ask the Pro Season 3, Episode 4, Business 101. Um, welcome to Ask the Pro Series. This is our third season. We are committed to presenting these episodes throughout the year, so save Fridays at 8 uh, for the Coffee Technician Guild. Uh, this presentation is informal purses only. The views and opinions expressed in this webcast are those of presenters and do not necessarily reflect the official policy position aspect of the Specialty Coffee Association or companies that panelists may represent. And now I'd like to introduce our panel and speakers. Uh, again, my name is Caleb Leach uh, from Starbucks. I will be a panelist today. And what we like to do in these episodes is um, share what coffee we're having in the morning, or if it's the afternoon for you, maybe what bev you know beverage you're having at the moment, or maybe just your favorite coffee, however that works for you. Uh, I'm personally having a, a Guatemalan from a little local roaster down the street from me, delicious kind of cinnamon and uh, brown sugar flavors with a hint of citrus. Uh, I made it as with a pour over, as a pour over this morning. Sorry, I, I'm still working on my first cup, so I'm still <laughs> over uh, some of my words here, but <laughs> it's delicious, uh, uh, believe me. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask each of our uh, speakers here to do a short introduction and, uh, and describe their cup of coffee this morning. So Kurt, I'm going to go to you first. I am Kurt with Last Man out in Denver, Colorado. So I run a company uh, consisting of four field service techs, not including myself. And I actually have a refurbished in-shop facility down in Colorado Springs. And then for this morning, I'm actually not drinking coffee. I'm drinking peppermint tea. So sorry hell? about that one. What? Are, you are you feeling okay? Yeah. Did you? No, it just sounded good this morning. <laughs> That's like Mark That's and okay. his key. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kurt. Mark, go to you next. Uh, I'm Mark. I own the Espresso Tech Service Company. We're headquartered out of Kansas, um, but we cover 11 states. Uh, we have, I believe, 22 uh, field technicians. Um, we focus primarily on super automatics, a lot of corporate accounts. Um, but really run the whole gamut um, on there. Today, I am uh, finally, after three weeks of being sick and drinking lemon water all day, um, we have a regional uh, sea store uh, quick trip. They make a fantastic uh, uh, coffee. It is also a Guatemalan. I don't think it has the citrusy uh, taste that Caleb's does, uh, but <laughs> but for a sea store, they make actually really good coffee. So it's, uh, it's, it's usually my daily stop. Nice, does the trick. Thanks, Mark. Jake? Uh, my name is Jake. Uh, I got a small repair company in Nashville. Small as in it's just me. Uh, currently in the growing phase where there's a lot of work to do. We just got, we bought a commercial building and we're going to hopefully blow that out and start hiring technicians soon. Um, focus mostly on specialty, uh, but we have gotten recently into the super autos to fulfill the roasters needs we work with. Um, and then I'm honestly terrible because I made iced coffee yesterday. It's from a local roaster here, but I couldn't tell you what country it's from because I paid no attention. <laughs> but it tastes great. 
Make sure it does the trick. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Because like my last three weeks of coffee has been like two day old coffee that I couldn't remember. So you're good. And I guess, uh, you know, a little background before I came to Starbucks, I, I ran a service company for the last, uh, the 15 years before I came to Starbucks to be the equipment services manager. So I do have some experience in this space as well. Hylan? I'm actually not drinking two day old coffee. I'm drinking a coffee from the Congo, which I did not know that the Congo was a coffee producing country. Um, mm -hmm. It actually tastes very similar to yours. It's a little more lemony than I'd like for my morning brew. It's yeah. kind of an afternoon kind of taster, but it's got some interesting flavors. Um, you guys ready to get started? Yeah. Alan, okay. where you, a little, um, tell us a little bit about espresso. Oh, um, I've been a service manager in operations for about 20 years. I've been working for Espresso Partners as their West Coast service manager for six. I worked for Tim O'Connor at Pacific Espresso for 12 years running service. So you've got a lot of experience here. So I hope you guys have a lot of questions. Right on. So kick it off for us, Hyland. You've got it. So it's easy to start a tech business. And a lot of guys think that all you need are tools. And any one of us will agree with that. And a car and some knowledge. Maybe, maybe not. There's a lot to consider. Liability, insurance, accounting, and human resources. What we tried to do for today was put together an episode with three panel members who are at different levels of business. Jake owns a one-man shop. As he said during his description, he's struggling to figure out how to grow. He's got questions. He doesn't know what to do. And we're all kind of going back and forth trying to decide when we were trying to decide what well, what the main critical point was, was, you know, hire a bookkeeper. Kurt has four plus techs. He's expanding into refers and Mark has techs nationally. So not only does he deal with local techs, he also deals with third party techs and a massive group of technicians. So we're going to go over the trials and tribulations today of what it means to own a business, tips to help you get started and tips to help you avoid the bad stuff. So let's get started. And technology 101. So when starting a business, what are the things you need to consider? And our panel can jump in here at any point in time. Where are your sales going to come from? That's really crucial because what I always ask myself is, is the customer I'm going to bring on today going to give me income today, tomorrow, and in the next five years? Can you build a foundation of reoccurring income? Do you have potential for PM programs? What are the laws in your area concerning setting up business, taxes, liability, and licensing? How much inventory do you need? Are you gonna spend $5,000 or $50,000? How will you determine your rates? What are your rates in the region? What are your competitors rates? How will you invoice and collect payment? And then an important one, which you'll find when you become a tech with a single house is what's your warranty policy? You guys know the story. How many people come back at us and say, you were just here six months ago replacing the steam valve and it's not working again. So what's your warranty policy? And Will you need to hire? And what does that mean? Because there's a ton of liability and tax ramifications to hire. And most importantly, and we will actually cover this in two weeks at Dispatch 101, is what software platforms will you use? Will you use a dispatching software? And the last, and we all agree, the most important question is, have you hired a bookkeeper? <laughs> so let's start with Mark. Why start a service business? Uh, well, personally, I started a service business because, I mean, I I just knew as a kid, I didn't, I just always wanted to be my own boss. I don't know why, but I gravitated toward that. It was either that or be a California Highway Patrolman because I love that show Chips. Uh, and I always saw myself as Eric Estrada, um, the cool guy. Um, so, uh, and that's when my, when my mother was alive. That's what she would always say. You're going to be one of two things. Um, I didn't necessarily want to be in the coffee business when I started. I just knew I wanted to to start a business, but that was just a, something that I wanted to do. And and for whatever reason, I had the fortitude to to go do it. Um, it wasn't there wasn't the uh, you know a need. Um, you know, I mean, it it really started with. I mean, I met a girl. Um, you know, she introduced me to coffee, and coffee worked out. The girl didn't, and 25 years later, I'm still in the business. So that's why I started it. You'd have to have your own reasons on why you wanted to start if you just if you don't want to you know if you want to be your own boss if you want to you know try to uh, try to try to build something from scratch and pass it on um you know those are going to be really your you're really going to have to sit and you know have a come to jesus meeting with yourself on you know if it's something you want to do which we'll discuss later the visual of you with eric strata here will forever be embedded in my mind 
I used to I have it. I swear to God, I used to have it. <laughs> Jay, I hope how about you? up to your service calls on one of those Harleys with your tools in a bag, you know? Okay. Like, not, not, non sequitur. <laughs> when, Chad, when Chad Baez from, from La Marzocca used to work with solutions, I got a call okay. once that the service tech just showed up on a Harley with his tools on the back of his ride. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay, Jake, your turn. Uh, I guess why I started it is I actually kind of fell into it. Uh, I did a handful of odd mechanical jobs. Uh, like I, I was the kid who would flip lawnmowers and snowblowers as a kid. Um, and then I worked on motorcycles and cars in high school. And then I actually used to repair machine shop machines. Um, and I was like, man, I love fixing things, but like the environment for fixing things is terrible. Like working in a hot machine shop was awful. Um, and then I actually asked Bill just to get out of, I grew up in Illinois and, uh, kind of fell into it. Somebody, I, my sister worked at a shop and she's like, nobody can fix our espresso machine. I took a look at it. I was like, no, this is really hard. I could probably do this. And then I kind of, refer, I bought some used La Marzocco's and refurbished them. And then I was like, man, I could work in air conditioning and work on cool things. And the grossest thing I have to deal with is milk and coffee like cool sign me up <laughs> Kurt how about you uh pretty much I have always had the passion for fixing stuff just like Jake was saying as a kid I'd sit there and rip stuff apart and put it back together and uh, my parents hated buying me anything at my birthday time I would like if they got me uh remote control cars they were ripped apart before I even actually played with them and I'd figure them out and then I'd put them back together and sometimes I'd figure out how to put like two or three together and make some like monster remote control car. But um, because of that, I always knew I wanted to be a service or do some kind of repair work. I liked working with my hands and it was just kind of fun to me. And then uh, I was probably 13 or 14 when I, I can't remember the first like uh, Pete's or Starbucks or something was in Colorado. My parents took me there and I saw the espresso machine and I always thought those were the coolest darn machines ever. And so I was like, oh man, I'd love to learn how to work on those someday. And then about nine years ago, the opportunity presented itself where a friend of a friend talked to me and him and said, hey, you guys want to start doing the espresso machines in Colorado? And I was like, uh, yeah. I'm still at it. I mean, so this is kind of one of those things. I always thought coffee was cool. I always thought the machines were cool. And being able to get into it was just amazing. But uh, basically, the big thing is passion. I was just trying, sorry. Passion is why I started my business, because I like working on stuff. So, Caleb, you took the operations route, just a little bit of a non sequitur. What, what made you decide to take that route? I'm sorry, Kyle, what was that? You took the operations route like me rather than opening a service business. What made you decide to take the operations route? Uh, well, I mean, I did I did have service. Uh, I did run a service company for, right. for like 15 years. But, um, you know, I think I'd, I, the, the reason that I'd made the switch to um, this, this role um, was just really to to try something new and, and different you know and and be able to stay in the same kind of coffee tech community um really like i'm in this business because i love the culture and i love i love coffee you know i i fell in love it with with this business when i was learning how to roast coffee and i didn't even know that i could fix uh that, that cof, uh, fixing coffee equipment was a job i could have um, and, and part of my job as that coffee roaster was to repair the equipment. And the idea is uh, for our customers, well, the idea was that we spent all this time um, sourcing high quality coffee, roasting it to the specs that we thought made it taste the best. And then within the last 10 feet to the customer, it could completely get lost. So we made sure every time um, we went out to one of our customers that the equipment was working. So I'd deliver coffee and tune up the equipment at the same time. And then later I found that I could get a job just fixing equipment. Now, you know, fast forward to 2018 um, and I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years roughly uh, one way or another. Uh, this seemed like a new opportunity where I could expand my horizons a little bit and learn some more about um, the coffee technician world sort of in a global uh, environment. 
if that answers you. your question. Totally, I appreciate it. So where do you start? So first you have to ask yourself, and, and I know you guys did this, is can you actually make money on it? We all kind of dived into it. Did you ever ask yourself, will I make money on it? What's the long term? Decide on legal structure, sole proprietorship, corporation or partnership, and then register your business name. Register your business name with county clerk and fictitious or assumed business name if necessary. And then do you know who your competition is? Are you getting involved with it at one level because a friend's asking you, or do you have customers that are going to pay the bills down the line? And that comes to the last point is, do you know who your customer is? Do you know who your customer will be tomorrow, one year, two years, five years down the line? And Kurt, this was the slide you wanted. <laughs> Kurt made a request, but actually I have, I have, a, I have a quick question um, for Mark, Jake and Kurt. When you guys started your business, how much did you consider the legal aspects of setting it up? The 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 name, the proprietorship, the liability, and that stuff. Mark, let's start with you. Um, I was a 26 year old novice. I didn't know anything <laughs> about anything. But uh, <clears throat> luckily, I had a uh, I had a friend who was a banker, and her husband was a dental student. I needed some work on my mouth. I didn't have insurance. Uh, he helped me, and it hurt like hell. But <clears throat> they had a friend who was an attorney. And uh, so I met Kevin, uh, who's now the uh, general counsel at AMC Theaters, and uh, Kevin navigated that for me and, and educated me on, on doing all of that kind of stuff and how important it was. But uh, without that, you know, two minute conversation under the gas, I probably would have tried to do it uh, alone. And, and it's one of my it's one of my big no no's. Uh, you have to have an attorney um, to to get it all set up. So so I was pretty green. I think most people are pretty green. They get intimidated by it. It's actually a very easy process and it's worth the three hundred dollars to have the lawyer do as much as he can. And there's still some legwork you'll have to do um, with your uh, your city and state, um, but they'll take care of the bigger stuff. Jake, how about you? Um, I think it's. As soon as I worked on an espresso machine and saw how much energy a steam boiler stores, I was like, I need liability insurance now. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, no, when, once I worked, I mean, having worked with uh, steam and heating prior to it, I, I understand the potential energy there is stored and the risks and dangers of it. Um, so as far as that is, like, I immediately got liability insurance. Um, and I was working under somebody for a good six months and they were like, you need to do this on your own because we don't, we don't, we don't want to get in equipment. And then, uh, so that's when I did it on my own and I worked with a, there's like a local business that specializes in getting all your ducks in a row for starting a business. And it's a very, like Mark said, spend the three or 400 bucks. They'll get you set up right. And you don't have to worry about getting in legal trouble or anything like that. Thanks, Jake. Kurt, how about you? Uh, so the biggest thing I did was coming from a family of entre entrepreneurs, actually. Um, the biggest one was I was told to talk to my accountant before or find an accountant, talk to the accountant before I did anything, because the accountant looked at who I was, what my property assets are. And then he's the one that told me which way to incorporate or to set up the the structure of the company before I did anything. So I actually talked to him and then went like Mark saying, um, went between an accountant and a lawyer and decided what way to structure the company. Okay. Our co-producer Clinton, who couldn't make this episode, chimed in and said, in addition to the list, make sure you do a, a name search for similar named businesses, just in case something else is out there, which is a really good point. Um, Kurt, I'm going to turn the slide over to you, my man. Okay. So one of the biggest things when you are coming into this industry, first thing you'd want to do is you're going to ask, who are your customers going to be? And do they have any requirements for you to work for them? This is a big one because, yeah, and I see you shaking your head, Mark, because you know that. And um, <laughs> you, as Hyland said earlier, are they going to pay your bills today, tomorrow, five years down the road? So you're kind of got to plan out who your customers really are. It's not just kind of, let me go find customers. It's got to be, what customers do I want? Do I want to be um, the niche customers or do I want to be uh, large contract corporation customers? So ask yourself that question before you do any of this. Um, but 
because like when you get into some of these customers, we have required hours of operations that we have to be available for them. Um, and that's all detailed out in the service level agreements, the fun contracts we all sign if we have corporate customers. Um, Cause they'll tell in those contracts, our customers will state, you know, we have certain amount of time to get to a call, to fix a call. Uh, they're gonna actually ask us to stock X amount of parts per technician. And they will actually above and beyond that, they'll say, we want you to have so many parts in your office or warehouse available for those techs above and beyond what's in their vehicles. So think about all that. That's a lot to go, wow, do I do I have this money to put out up front for all these parts? Uh, and what kind of repairs are they going to be asking of you? Are you going to be certified to do those repairs? Um, or do you have to get a certification? And do you have to sign a contract? Do you need, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one, um, the preventative maintenance. So a lot of times, this is the great part about getting a larger customer is you have the guaranteed preventative maintenance, but it's just going out and making sure you're doing this work on a regular basis for them. But you're all under contract now, so you got to think through all that. Are you willing to work all these hours? Are you willing to sign a contract for all the agreements about completion times, parts on stock, parts on hand, what you can order? It's just a huge amount of information to think about just before you even hit the road for that first customer or for, yeah. So I have, I have a question for all of you, including you, Caleb, because we've all done specialty coffee and we've all done the large contracts. Is it, is it financially feasible to specialize and say, I'm just going to do specialty coffee? Or do you, when you're opening your business, do you really need to take a solid look at corporate customers? Jake's smiling. So we're going to start with Jake on that question. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've done it with specialty just because I think we are kind of got this specialty bubble happening in Nashville. Um, but no, I definitely am looking at more and more of the specialty stuff is more hit or miss. There's not more, it's not as regular of work than say, uh, we recently, or I started getting more and more corporate customers downtown. There's a couple like banking towers that got to grottos and I'm now doing the national airport as well. Um, and those I, I definitely see now when you're trying to grow it and you're trying to get multiple people, those are kind of key. Maybe not key. I think I still could do it in specialty, but it would be a lot harder. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, when, when I started, you know, there wasn't a lot in 96, 95, um, you know, so I just kind of fixed whatever. I also had, you know, some coffee shops at the time because, um, you know, I was trying to do it all. <clears throat> and I did, I made a decision like around 2000 when Starbucks came out with, you know, their super automatic finally. Um, and I had done a little work for them, you know, I, and, and I had come from very briefly, I had one corporate job about, for about three years, um, but it was very corporate. And so I kind of understood that process and um, on how to act with a corporation um, and how to, you know, talk to them and, and uh, not necessarily negotiate a contract is really, Honestly, there's no negotiation in contracts. It's here it is, take it or leave it. Um, but I did decide to specialize. So I, I vacated the, the independent coffee shop route and I went all corporate. So, you know, anything really with the Starbucks logo. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to mention a name. Uh, we, uh, you know, that's, that's really where we went with. And, and I just happened to hit it at the right time in the right place. And, and so, you know, that's, that's really where our bread and butter comes from. We do a few local chains, but... <clears throat> You know, like Kurt said, if you can navigate the uh, the the contracts and and be able to agree to do that, you know, the work is good and it's steady, and uh, and you can actually, you know, even though you're under contract, you can also ultimately build a relationship where they do, you know, value you as a vendor, and so so that's really been our whole plan of attack. Kurt, thank you, Mark. Um, well, so your question was about the. The parts are specializing, right? No. The, so the question is, is, can you make it on just doing specialty coffee, or do you, as you do, you, as you as you plan out, do you really need to consider the food service aspect of what we do? Um, it, it's really going to be. 
do you have a name for yourself is what I think it is. If you're going to plan on being only specialty coffee. Uh, there are companies, even in my area, that don't do a single corporate contract. They do all specialty. Uh, so they're doing, you know, all the high-end espresso machines, uh, traditionals. But they have a name for themselves. The, the owner of that company has been known around Colorado for a while. And it's feasible, it's possible, but it, it's not something that most people are going to be able to do, honestly. You're, right. I, I really think corporation or corporate contracts and small chain contracts are what you really need to be able to keep the business going and growing. Thank you. So, Caleb, when you were at Texas Coffee Tex, what was your what was your market? What was your your sales mix uh, between large scale and independents? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I guess my my answer to this is don't limit yourself. Um, I, my first the first business I opened was a coffee shop, and we had a kitchen. And and due to you know fixing espresso machines and coffee brewers around town, I met a lot of chefs and business owners and. Um, I was developing a menu for the coffee shop and one of the chefs that I knew pretty well that owned a few restaurants came in regularly and I, and I was talking to him and I said, hey, I was thinking about, you know, a lot of my customer base is vegan, vegetarian. Maybe I should just make a niche for myself and be, you know, that vegan kind of cafe. And, and he was like, I mean, I see people over there eating bacon. I don't think you should limit yourself like <laughs> <laughs> don't, you know, then those people that want the bacon aren't going to come, you know, and um, and so <laughs> turns out that a lot of vegans stretch to bacon sometimes. I don't know why. Uh, but, but yeah, so I think the idea is don't limit yourself. And then to answer your question, Highland, um, we had a, a mix. I mean, uh, Coffee Text had been around since 93 um, in, in Austin and we had, uh, you know, convenience stores, uh, restaurants, hotels. We were doing installs for manufacturers. We were doing corporate business. Like anything that came our way, we'd do it. And it's a tricky balance. But that's where, you know, you gotta, you've got to decide what it is that you can do right now and then, and then plan for the future so that you can potentially move into more, right? So like always, like what, what are my next steps to to get into more business, do I need to hire somebody if I take on this extra step? You know, there's there's just a lot of um, forethought and planning as you expand. So yeah. maybe it starts by just working on your local cafes and restaurants and folks you know, and then as you grow, you can make that jump, get a little money, little capital from the bank, invest in some bookkeepers. <laughs> well, that, I mean, thanks <laughs> for saying that. You know, that that actually leads on to the next question, and it's it, it you know it's something that we're going to impress upon this entire presentation, you guys is, and I'm going to start with Mark and then and then Jake because they made some really good points. And the question is, do you need an accountant when you start up? We all know we need to ha hire an accountant two years later when we've got that stack <laughs> of invoices out there. But how important is this at startup? What do you why do you need an accountant before you before you issue that first invoice? Jake, you made a couple really good points, so I'm going to start with you. Um, I think it, it, it all depends on how, I guess it, it depends on the person. Like for me, I was pretty savvy with a lot of that stuff. So I did take care of all my books for a couple of years there, but you get to a point where you're getting so busy with service calls that it's not time well spent. Um, your time's better spent out there fixing more machines, doing what you're good at, giving somebody else something that they're good at um so i would say if it's something you like to do or you have experience with it like it's okay um i still hired one at the end of every year to look over like do my taxes and all that stuff um but if if you're not if you're not savvy with it if you're not into that stuff i don't recommend doing it yourself because you're going to probably make a mess and you're going to if you hire that person at the end of the year, you're going to make their job terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, your turn. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yeah, I'll disagree totally. I would not ever recommend uh, starting a business without an accountant. Uh, number one, they all they do is look at your numbers. Um, you know, they can help you navigate those numbers. Um, 
you know, because they see it from a different standpoint, you know, you're out there trying to do the job, you know, getting it done. Yeah, you're going to send them a bill, but then you're looking at the next job, uh, especially if you're an independent or a one person shop like Jake is, you know, now, you know, you're really, I mean, you know, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, he said he did like 13 installs in one day or something. I mean, how do you physically get home and then bill all those calls? Because, I mean, you have serial numbers to track, you know. It's just a lot and it's just easier to hand that over. And yes, at the end of the year, when you turn that over to a bookkeeper or a CPA, which is my other recommendation, you know, it'll cost you a lot less if your books are in order. Like if you do have somebody on, uh, you know, doing QuickBooks and all the numbers balance up to zero, your balance sheets are good. You know, it, you, you cruise right in and out of the CPA. If you don't, you know, they charge by the hour. So you can take a, you know, a $300 tax return and turn it into a, you know, a $5,000 tax return. And that's just money that you're losing just from not being prepared. So I always suggest it's money well sent right out of the gate. Even if you feel like you're savvy, no offense to Jake, but uh, I would never recommend it ever. So wait, Mark, would you start? I'm just kidding. Um, What's that? Not, I don't get to mess with you, but no. Kurt, how no, about no. you? Um, as I actually said earlier, I hired an accountant right away because it's, I, I used the accountant to tell me which way to structure when I started, because I, I I didn't know what to do. And in reality, a lawyer is going to look at you and go, well, I'll structure it however you want. How do you want to structure it? And I'm still going, I have no idea. So that's why I went to the accountant right away. I was just like, tell me how to structure. And he said, oh, yeah, you are this. So I want you structured this way and this way and this way. And I was like, okay. And they had it taken care of. So, yes, hire an accountant as soon as you start they don't need to be there every day. As Mark was saying, it's more just the accountant is to hand your books over to quarterly for taxes and then maybe uh, at the end of the year for the entire taxes just to make sure everything's done right. Thank you. So I, I have an interesting story. It's been my 20s when I was started in coffee. A friend of mine actually gave me the same advice, which was as a human, hire an accountant. And I, I have to say it was the best advice I ever got because I met with them twice a year, went through my invoices with them, and in terms of planning and growing and doing the adulting thing, it's probably the most valuable 300 bucks a year I ever spent. <laughs> what type of insurance do I need? And you guys, this is a, a general list, so if any of you guys want to add in here, please do it. You definitely need professional liability insurance, as Jake pointed out, with the size of the boiler and the power that you're dealing with. If you have property, you'll need property insurance. Workers' compensation insurance, um, we all have nightmare stories about workers' comp. Workers' compensation insurance is crucial if you're gonna have a tech, um, vehicle insurance, and business interruption insurance. There is insurance out there that you could get. I actually found out about this during COVID that can insure your business and your staff for losses of business. Do you guys have anything to add on that, Mark? Uh, obviously you have to have, if you're going to have any business, you have to have liability. Like Jake said, right. you know, uh, workman's comp, that's an interesting one. A lot of people require it, but, um, we self-insure on that because, you know, we, again, with bookkeeper, you know, we went through all the numbers and the amount of money we were spending on workman's comp and the claims that we had, the numbers were drastically different. So we went ahead with a self-insure policy on that, um, property insurance. Jake just bought a building. I'm very jealous. I wish that I was, would have bought a building years ago. <laughs> Um, but it just didn't, you're, you're thinking way, you're way ahead of the curve, Jake, um, on there. But even if you rent, you still have to have property insurance. I mean, you have, you have customers equipment in there, you know, at any time. And I'm sure, I'm sure Kurt has at any time, probably a million dollars worth of equipment sitting in there. If that thing goes up in flames, you know, your, your, your liability may cover it, but you know, you're also going to have some kind of property insurance as well. Um, and vehicle insurance, ugh, that is the bane of my existence. Um, <laughs> oh, so come on. <laughs> Why it is, is so that? Expensive. I'll tell you, uh, our insurance starts with a two. Uh, the next number is a five and there's four zeros. It is stupid expensive. Um, but, you know, it's it costs a lot of money, but you got to have it for your uh, for your staff. So vehicle insurance is really important because once you hire people, they treat your cars like like right. rental cars. And it, it's it frustrates <laughs> me. So, Jake, um, how's how's the process? Sorry, Mark. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mark's going to start crying. <laughs> 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 so, so jake as a startup how much did you consider in, insurance in your mix and do you have um, for no. yourself? I, 
if, if you're one person, uh, I don't think you can get workman's comp for one person. You have to have employees to get it. Um, don't quote me on that. Not 100% sure. Um, but no, I immediately had, uh, I immediately had liability insurance as well as people. I mean, this applies to smaller tax. If you are using your personal vehicle, you have to buy commercial insurance on it. Um, that, that even goes for like Uber drivers and stuff like that. If you get caught working and you have personal coverage on a vehicle you're using commercially, uh, your insurance company can deny it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's it. And then, yeah, I, even, you know, at our small property too there, uh, as Mark said, like, I have all the inventory insured because that was the first thing I did before I moved anything in there, called my insurance company and said, Hey, what do I need on my commercial building? Is approximately, I don't know, I estimated 25% over the maximum I'd ever have in there. And I, I have coverage on all that because most of those are customers' machines. And like you said, if they go up in flames, you've got to replace it or figure out, you know, something for them because that's, that's not okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Kurt? Um, Anything to add? It, actually, just a good umbrella policy is really important. Um, because, you know, if you have a good umbrella, it will cover a lot of that. So that's actually probably another good thing. Make sure you talk to a good insurance agent <laughs> have a good one on your phone. I, I can call my agent anytime, any day and talk to her. So it's actually, that's probably one we actually did forget to leave out. Have a good agent. <laughs> that's a good point. So we're going to skip the first I question. I call out there, Highland, one real quick. Yeah. We talked about the corporate accounts, and I ran across this, uh, you know, as I was running copy text, too. Different corporate accounts want different levels of liability insurance mm -hmm. to enter their building. So you you might end up having to make some changes along the line. And that's okay. It's usually pretty easy, and it's not that cost uh, costly either. But um, as you take those on, you might have to increase what your liability is uh, to, to like go work for them. I mean, most corporate accounts now, because I work with a lot of corporate, require a million dollars in yeah. liability. Maybe Let more. me bring up one thing real quick. Um, another thing to think about with the insurance when we're talking about the coverage amount. So I have one account that was going to require me to get um, a $10 million bond pol or insurance policy. God. And it was only for two sites and I was it was so I could drive in a restricted area and so on. And I looked at the numbers and I said, I, these two sites won't pay for it. They're yeah. not even close. So it's just like, nope, I'll you guys can pay the time for my tax to go through security, all that fun stuff, <laughs> versus me paying it was something like another $25,000 a year or something insane like that just so we could maybe make $2,000 a year from those sites. Right. Why would I pay that? So start look at those numbers too. So here's just, just a quick answer on this next one. And we'll start with, I'm going to start with Caleb for this one. Do you have an oh crap story where you were really glad you had insurance? Um, <laughs> no. Oh no. Oh, I no. think Mark can do a whole episode on this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass I'll pass on this one. Mark <laughs> We can skip the question. I just thought it was a good question. Mark, no, it is good. I just don't have a good one. No. So uh, we did a we did a repair on a machine. Uh a, an independent. They were in a, a little kind of a a town where you go and you visit. I mean, there's not a lot of residents there, but it's one of those touristy type towns. She was in an older building. She had a machine. <clears throat> we worked on it. Two days later, <clears throat> completely floods the building. I mean, total total wipeout. Floods the the second floor, the first floor, the basement, or whatever. And <clears throat> it was like a two year legal battle on you know whose fault it was um, to to deal with that. Um, and ultimately, my insurance company navigated the whole thing um, on there. And so you know we didn't really have to deal with it. And I don't even know if they came up to a settlement or whatever, um, but you know we had that. I also had when we had a little shop, we had a slip and fall um, on there, and I we had cameras. I spent way too much time uh, with the insurance company trying to deal with that to show that she actually slipped on a piece of ice. I felt I <clears throat> I had uh, done my uh, couch legal work on there, 
And uh, ultimately the insurance company, you know, they settle that for you, but we've had, I mean, you don't think it's gonna happen to you, but man, it it does. Kurt, thank you. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate that. Kurt, how about you? Um, it's actually not so much that I was glad I had it. It was, I was glad one of the businesses I was in had it. Um, it was actually one of my techs was in a commercial like, store and they slipped and fell in the commercial store and they just took care of the tech. They were just like, okay, let's get your medical paid, this, that, done, done. So it wasn't even a worry for me and my tech. It was just a nice and easy dealt with. So I, I will actually say, I think them for having their insurance policies done right. Yeah. Thanks. Jake, you're still young, but do you have a story? Uh, yeah, knock on wood. I, I haven't had any, had to use my insurance yet. Um, but I have heard of some cafe owners. There's one recently that's uh, a very fancy part of town. Uh, this wasn't anything to do with a coffee technician, but they had a guy servicing their sprinkler system and he was, or he was cleaning their hoods. That's what he was doing. And he tripped and fell off his ladder and grabbed a sprinkler line when he was falling and yanked it out of the ceiling. Oh my and, God. And uh, flood, he flooded like two or three floors. Cause I, I had to go in and decommission and pull out their equipment. That's why I heard about this. But um, yeah, I, I said something, I know the owner pretty well of the business and I was like, yeah, that's why I have like a huge liability and policy. Cause I'm like, stuff like that terrifies me. And she goes, yeah, we're, we're, pretty much he's maxed it out i was like oh boy that's my worst nightmare <laughs> so you hear about things like that makes you realize the importance of having it thanks jake so hey and just got... a, one last thing on that highland just so you're yeah. clear on <clears throat> on the insurance side of it like uh um like kurt said there's umbrella policies you really have to have an agent that can navigate all that for you but if you have a million dollar policy and something happens and you exceed a million dollars uh you're on the hook for it I mean, right. they'll only pay a yep. million dollars. So if you, you know, if, if, if something got for, you know, something terrible happens, you need to just make sure that, you know, you have something over there. We, we carry, you know, a $2 million policy, but it's a 1 million with a 1 million umbrella and that's cheaper. And again, a, an insurance agent can navigate all that for you to make sure you have the coverage and you're not overpaying. Yep. That's a, actually a good point. We had some issues with that when I was, Still with Pacific Espresso because most of the companies we work with were asking for five million dollar policies, and oh, you like, yeah, it's like when like you bring up Kurt is, where's the value in that? Because you're looking at you know four figures that you're gonna you're gonna you might service two pieces of equipment. So make sure that you you have your bookkeeper do a cost analysis of it. And is it worth having that insurance? So this next slide is from Mark Rovey. We go through a lot of vetting through through all of our presentations. The group that are talking actually we really review it. We go through revisions and revisions and revisions and Mark made a really valid point. And he said, these items absolutely have to be have to be in here. So I wanted to give Mark a little minute to discuss his items. Mark, I'll try to keep I'll try to keep it under a minute. This is a big subject matter. Um, a yes, you gotta have an accountant CPA right off the bat. I mean, you're you're foolish if you don't. Uh, you'll think that you're smarter, but but you have to. You have to have an attorney. Um, to navigate the legal thing. Uh, most importantly though, especially for Jake here, when you get employees, I would never do my own payroll. Um, if you have- Oh no, no. No, I don't do any of my books now. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do paychecks or ADP, those are recognized by the IRS. Um, and they're, although you still have to sign a piece of paper that says, you know, technically you're responsible to make sure all the forms are filled out. <laughs> blah, 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 all the legalese, um, because there's too many lawyers on the planet. Um, the IRS will leave you alone in that case. Like if you do that, um, uh, you won't have any problems. And I know this from experience because yes, in the beginning, I thought I was smarter than everybody. So I did my own uh, payroll. I tried to do my own books um, uh, on a spreadsheet that, that didn't go very well. Um, and if you've never been audited by the IRS, um, I'm a two-time felon with that because um, you know, we did things wrong in the early stages. So, you know, one of my now IRS requirements, because you become friendly with them, uh, is that <laughs> I always have to stay on, I know, I, you always have to stay on paychecks or ADP. That was like their requirement for me and said, Mark, if you just do that, you know, we'll never bother you again. But you have to, you know, because you don't know, like when you do payroll, you know, 
it, let's say that you know a tech makes a thousand dollars a week and you write him a check for seven fifty, you know, and you're running your business, you don't realize that. Well, you do. You should, but you're not going to sock that three hundred and fifty dollars away. That you live in fantasy world if you think that you do because you have parts, you have expenses, you have fuel, mm -hmm. you know, you've got all these things that you have to pay. And you're as a small business owner, you'd be like, I'll deal with that when it comes up. I'll fill out the form, and then it's that oh crap moment of holy cow, I owe. Four thousand dollars, and I don't have it. Now you might scramble and get it for the first couple filings, but then you're going to fall behind. And then once you start falling behind on those payroll taxes, on those nine forties and nine forty ones, you really get in hot water pretty quick. And that's what happened to me. I mean, I just I was ignorant. I just didn't know um, that. I thought I could. I thought it was sort of a gray area that if they eventually got their money, everything would be good. And that's that's really not the case on there, you know. And as far as the uh, you know the bookkeeping and the CPAs. You know, I initially relied on, you know, TurboTax and 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 uh, uh, QuickBooks. I mean, we still use QuickBooks. That's a fine product, but and there's nothing against TurboTax, you know, but when I did, I I followed all the steps on my business and it told me what I could and couldn't do. And it turns out what it said I could do, I couldn't do. And it ended up being about a hundred thousand dollar mistake. And uh, the IRS gave me no leeway. They're like, hey. You should have an accountant. You should have a CPA <laughs> do all your stuff. It's I mean, I think I've lost more money than I've ever made um, at the end of the day because of all these mistakes. And I tell everybody, if you want to start a business, talk to me because I've made every mistake in the book uh, and I'll tell you how to avoid it. But these are the things that you really have to have that you, you know, in the beginning, you'll think you know how to do it, but but it's not worth it because at the end of the day, all of those right there maybe cost you five hundred dollars a month, maybe because a lot of them are just maintenance. Uh, you know, uh, fees on there. And some of them are one-time fees. I mean, I can't remember the last time I talked to my attorney. I mean, I pay him $250 a year to be a registered agent and I never have to talk to him, but he's there if I need it. Um, you know, but you just need to have somebody on file. Uh, That's my story. I just want to add real quick on the paychecks or ADP, you can use them as an independent as a man. So that way all the payroll taxes, if you pay yourself, can still be filed. So I just want to make sure people understand that you don't have to wait till you have two people, three people. As an independent, I was using ADP just to pay myself. That way I didn't have to worry about any of the payroll taxes or anything. So just put that out there for people to think about. That's actually, that's a really good point. That's actually a great point, Kurt. Thank you. Okay. I think what, what I... Oh, sorry, Chad. Oh. Go. No, I, I was just going to say, I think what I have to add to that is uh, you got to value your time. And that, that's what made me, uh, right. I didn't get to the point where Mark was, I, I would never take on payroll. Uh, when I said, you know, don't hire an accountant, right? I didn't say don't hire an accountant, but I would never take on payroll. Much. That is so, <laughs> when, I, when I said I didn't have one, I was just managing my expenses and income and tracking all my finances there. Uh, but it gets to a point where I kind of figured, I was like, look, I'm spending, I don't remember how much time I was spending every week, but I, I kind of figured if I'm spending more than four hours a month on this, it's not worth it. It's like somebody else will do it way more efficiently. They're going to do it better than you and for 300 bucks a month or whatever it costs you. That's what it costs me. Um, Cause it is way easier for me to go make $300 than it would be. It, there's pointless to save that $300. There's, you can go help two or three more customers make that $300 and pay somebody else their job well. Yeah, I, one of the things I find with payroll companies too is that they help you manage labor law. Mm -hmm. So living in California that has some of the most convoluted labor laws in the United States, I, I worked in cafes that would not do, that, didn't, that did their own, they wrote checks every two weeks and then they'd fire somebody and they would never pay them. And in the state of California, if you don't, do, if you don't pay them within 72 hours, they the clock starts ticking so somebody didn't get paid for three weeks we paid him for three weeks and we got the paychecks paychecks were like make sure the money's in the account make sure that you pay them right away so there's another advantage of having them is they actually do a really decent job actually managing the labor laws in your state because that's part of what their role is um our last size piece, piece of slide is from my mentor and somebody i worked with for about 15 years tim o'connor He's a former board president of the SCA and he owned Pacific Espresso, one of the first service companies in specialty coffee back in the 80s. Years ago at, at um, um, La Marzocco Out of the Box, he gave a presentation called The Seven Steps to Success. And this was for guys like us who wanted to start a service business. And I always thought this was a very elegant list. 
and uh, speaks to some of you guys because you've actually done a lot of this is get organized and have a plan is make sure you know what you're doing before that first service starts it goes back to the comment about know where your income's coming from tomorrow know where your income's coming from in a year know where your income's coming from in five years and then be responsive make sure you're responding to your customers even the customers you don't want show them the respect to say i don't want to deal with you speaking to kurt what was kurt was saying about doing the cash analysis if you have a customer that comes to you treat them with the same respect that you're going to treat a customer who's not going to give you money who is going to give you money if you don't want to deal with them explain why because they might come back at you and say oh well i was only going to give you two stores i have 50. so we'll just give you all 50 because we want to deal with you you never know what the next step is going to be then build a foundation of reoccurring revenue and i guarantee you all of you are going to shake your heads on this build a PM program <laughs> to, to bring your income in. Because right now, all of us rely on, I have three large scale PM programs that they just basically pay the bills. Document in a meaningful, meaningful manner. Remember, and I do this as a service man, manager, is train your techs to communicate. Because as a service manager, and I know Caleb has seen this a lot too, and probably Kurt and Mark is, I have to decipher the text information. And I fixed the machine does not tell me anything that tells the customer. What you want to make sure is when you're talking to it, <laughs> Kurt, Kurt shaking his head, what you want to make sure is that <laughs> what you're getting in your text, and we're actually going to discuss this at great lengths in one of our next episodes, is they're communicating to you because you're the one that's going to sit there and you're going to have to argue when you want to get paid. And I'm sure lots of us have had to argue bills where we want to get paid. Manage cash flow. That's one thing we haven't really impressed upon as much as we've impressed upon getting a bookkeeper because a bookkeeper would just know what your cash flow is going to be today know what your cash flow is going to be next month you know what your bills are plan for that always follow up with a customer satisfaction call that actually does matter because it shows the customer that you're paying attention and then my favorite one and i think all of us is pay your taxes so our parting advice other than scaring people off from starting a company <laughs> all of us all of us are guilty let's start with caleb is what would you tell someone who is about to start a service comp company were you given any advice that helped yeah um it reminds me when i was a kid i i i had applied to work at this again just like you guys I, I liked working on cars and motorcycles before i started working on coffee machines so i applied to work at this bmw shop because i thought they had a really cool shop and i wanted to work there over the summer and um, and I was like, whatever, I'll sweep floors, whatever it takes, get in the space. And uh, the guy, he didn't really know me very well, but he, he, he was like, Caleb, I want you to open the yellow pages and just kind of go through it and, and make sure that this is actually what you want to do, because you might end up doing it the rest of your life. And, and at the time, I was like, I don't like you very much. <laughs> you know, I just want to come sweep the floors, dude, you know, whatever. But it was pretty meaningful because what I did get into is something I'm very passionate about that I love very much. And, you know, I am doing it the rest of my life. So um, it, it rings true now is where it didn't. So I guess like with all of this organization and business planning and all the things that we're talking about, they're very important and, and they make sense in this business. But if you don't like what you're doing, it doesn't matter. So you know, if, if you hate fixing coffee machines and hanging out in coffee shops or restaurants and whatnot, doing this work, just don't do it. So my advice is make sure that you love what you do because you'll be happy no matter what. Thanks, Caleb. I appreciate that. Before we go on to Kurt, we are opening the floor to questions and we'll do those in a few minutes. Kurt, how about you? Uh, the biggest piece of advice I would say is um, when you're frustrated with the call, if you're on something that's just a head scratcher walk away for a few minutes because yeah, for sure <laughs> yeah exactly it, it, there's times where you'll get discouraged by those uh calls or you know just a, a bad call and if you walk away for a few minutes regather regroup you'll probably get a, a clear head and come back and it'll be fine so that's probably my biggest piece of advice stay calm Thanks, Kurt. Mr. Roby. 
Uh, I'm on the same. Uh, uh, well, I mean, those are both great points. I mean, it's uh, yeah, I've read every book under the sun. Um, I've listened to every tape program uh, out there for self motivation. Do, but I read a book one time. It was "Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow," and uh, I, that's a great book. And the money hasn't followed, but the whole point of it was don't do anything. <laughs> I'm hoping at the end of the, my days the money comes. Uh, it was, uh, you know. <laughs> Don't get into this for the money. I mean, I still drive 1997 Toyota 4Runner. All of my money goes to payroll, to parts, to growing the business, to, you know, leaving something to either my children or, you know, hopefully maybe one of my staff, you know, mm -hmm. who knows, but, but I'm not in this for the money. I'm like Kurt and, and Jake and, and Kayla. I just, I've always loved to fix stuff. Um, and I'm, I can't say that I wake up every day and go, yay, I get to deal with 22 texts that won't fill out paperwork and you know who send me of you know they've been on a call for four hours and say fixed it and then i have no idea how to build this um on there <clears throat> that's not fun but when i go out and have to be a tech i mean it reminds me of why i'm in this business i love fixing stuff i love dealing with customers especially local customers but even chain customers because we do you know and, and kurt's the same way you know even if you're in a big chain store, you treat them like a mom and pops, you know, you develop that relationship with the staff. But I love to fix stuff uh, on there. And, 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 and I didn't do this for the money. There's a great story uh, in Tom Stanley's Millionaire Next Door that talks about Warren Buffett. He interviewed 20 millionaires. And what I found was interesting was every single one of them drove their late model car until they were well into being billionaires. Gentlemen, we're going to go a little bit over to answer questions um, uh, just a few minutes, but I do want to address Sir Jake's answer, and then we'll go to questions. So, Jake, how about you? Uh, I would say don't know it all. Ask people who know better than you, and that goes for a lot of things. Uh, I see too many people going into this industry very hot-headed, thinking they know the answer to everything. And then I just feel like that will get you into hot water, whether it be like Mark said, thinking you know it all with your books or thinking you know it all with machines and you don't. Um, if you don't know, ask somebody who does. Um, Cause I just, I've seen a lot of that um, of just, you know, people starting it up and then don't just be like overly confident. I mean, not that you don't want to be confident in yourself, but also like just have a good, good caution with what you're doing <laughs> that's a good one mine mine was mine was speaks to a lot of what yours was it was early on in the barista business I, I got very swaggery because i thought i knew everything and somebody actually said what's going to be your biggest key to success is to have a sense of humility and understand that somebody else knows more than you and then the other one was to ask the right questions so we're going to go on to a couple of questions oh, and yeah. we'll wrap it up yeah i mean I became a big, big, I'll ask anybody, as you know me, I will email you and ask you questions if I'm looking for an answer. And it's been one of my most rewarding, irritating to some people, I'm sorry, Mark, habits that, <laughs> that, that I do, but I've learned so much because there's always somebody smarter than you. So we have two questions from Jordan Glover. Um, and if his first one is, and just raise your hand if you wanna answer this, is what was a pivotal part of customer acquisition as a starting tech? And then his second question, and this might be going for you, Jake, is as a one-man company, how important is it to have a building? I'll take You're on the first Kurt. one. Um, getting customers appearance. If you're just starting out and you show up in, you know, shorts and a Hawaiian shirt or something and say, hey, I'm here to fix stuff. <laughs> you're not, but... Sorry to pick on you on that. I didn't mean it that way. Um, but so, I mean, as you can see, I'm in a logo shirt right now. All my group is in logo shirts. They all, all my group actually has their names embroidered on their shirts. Yep, a logo shirt. And yep, see, we're all in logo shirts right now. So, oh, right. I, didn't, I didn't get the memo. Sorry, Kurt. I, <laughs> next week, I promise. Uh, but appearance. You want to, you want to take the don't have, Sorry, go ahead don't have a good appearance right away a customer is just going to kick you out the door so i would say that's very very important no that's a good point i mean you you it's it's realistic is you you are judged the minute the person sees you and i i remember that we were looking for money 
um, to buy a couple of cafes from the bank and it was in Santa Barbara and we showed up in shorts, tevas and t-shirts. And it was weird. For some reason, the banker didn't want to talk to us. I never really understood why. Jake, what about the, the question for the building? Um, for a one man show, I don't think it's that important, honestly. Um, I was getting to the point where we're getting so many machines in and refurbing. I bought, fortunately last year, did present opportunities to buy a lot of uh, used machines. And so now, I mean, you guys have probably experienced this, a lot of traditional machines, you can't get them. So we're selling used machines at a premium right now. Um, so I mostly needed it for storage but I also got it in preparation to hire other techs because hiring somebody out of your garage just is not professional. Um, and I just didn't want to do that. Okay. But Mitch, if you're saying uh, a one man show, I don't okay. think you need one. Thank you, Jake. Um, last question from Mitch Asbeck. And I'd actually like to hear from all of you guys on this because this is something we all deal with. It is what do you have, what do you do with the customer that hasn't paid their bill? You've communicated to them several times over the last six months, and all you get is checks in the mail. I'm going to start with Mark just because of his reaction. God. So in, in, in 99, that's why we left the independent uh, 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 ownership, uh, because I would, at the time, I mean, we were charging $45 an hour, and it would take me months and months to collect that $45, and it was can I pay you 10 bucks a week for our 10 bucks a month? And I'm like, no, uh, we ended up, it was just collections. It was very hard. Um, and uh, with, uh, and Kurt will attest to this, you know, with a corporate account, you know, if, you know, if you have a good relationship and they're a solid account, you know, they'll pay when they, when they need to pay. I mean, they'll pay when they're supposed to. And so that's almost guaranteed income, you know, and, either four well it's god forbid it ever be four it's always six or eight weeks you know you'll actually get a paycheck uh, collections is terrible i hate it um and it's hard and you end up having to write a lot of it off um and if you are in a market where you have uh, friendly competitors which i do um, i have two of them and typically if somebody calls me and i know that they have been using a different competitor we have a good enough relationship that I can call them or they'll call me and they'll be like, yeah, they don't pay their bills and they're not going to get service um, right. on there. So it, it, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. We, we end up just giving up. Okay. Thank you. Kurt, how about you? Um, I, I kind of look at it as two different ways. One, is it um, something I went out and did or is it something they brought to me? So one, like if it's something they brought to me and they're trying to save money, they have to pay on site before they can take that machine. So uh, I would never let a piece of equipment leave my site um, or leave my warehouse if it, they haven't paid for it. And especially new equipment, I will never deliver new equipment without full payment. Um, you know, it, it, that one's way too easy. So I would never let that happen. Um, I, I've seen that where a lot of people will try and finance their own equipment or equipment they're selling. I would say let someone else do the financing. That way you're not doing the collections on that. Try to keep your what money you're putting out as accounts receivable as low as possible. So I, I take credit cards from independents before I even go on site. I'm like, we need your number. We're going to bill you. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to try and prevent it. But as Mark said, there's a lot of times if they're not paying, you just have to write it off. Yeah. It, it collections, I mean, if you're trying to collect 200 bucks, you may end up getting what, Mark, 50 bucks, 60 bucks if they actually get paid. <laughs> so lucky. you just wasted three of your hours that you're billing anywhere between, I've heard anyone bill from 80 to 150, just depending on what city they're in. Now, don't, <laughs> yeah, so don't everybody run out and go say, oh, I get 150, but yeah, it's, <laughs> Um, it's a lot of it is, are you going to waste your time trying to collect that money and how much is your time worth? Because you could be out making more money on that service call. So just try and protect yourself up front is my big thing with that one. Well, to kind of speak to what's Kurt saying, I have a story of when I first got started, I was working with a company who was working with a large scale company who bought, pre-bought 25 machines 
um, two group machines based on the, the long-term relationship. They paid cash up front for the machines and their agreement was that this customer would buy the machines over a year period at an inflame, inflated rate. We bought the machines, we paid for the machine, then we got the letter that the customer is going into bankruptcy. There was no, we had no legal recourse to actually sell the machines and we couldn't return them. So one of the things about is make sure your policy is stated. And one thing is get a deposit for new equipment. Caleb, how about you? Yeah, I think I'd echo pretty much everything that everyone said here. And towards the end, uh, towards the, the time I left Coffee Techs, we didn't take any new customers that weren't COD and they had to give us a credit card up front. Um, we didn't charge, you know, we didn't charge it until after the job was done. And we always, always told them, you know, the minimum that it was going to cost to come out. So it was up front, like every call I took, it's going to cost this much at minimum for us to come out. So there was setting an expectation as part of it too. I think when you go out and it's a surprise, uh, customers are really like, whoa, I didn't think it was going to be that much or, you know, so I tell you, I told you up front like three times and we got the credit card. So when, when that transaction starts to happen, it's a little bit easier because, you know, you set the expectation. Up front. That's actually a really valid point, Caleb, that we should bring up during the dispatch 101 customer communication, because over the whole year, one second, like what I've seen in the last five years, because I work with so many third parties is they're all COD now, even for corporate customers, they're taking COD. Kurt, yeah, then we'll go on. Um, I just kind of going above and beyond what Caleb said. Just so uh, one of the things I have my dispatchers do when they talk to a new customer, and the new customer wants to schedule, they send them the credit card authorization form, and they send them our inclusive rate sheet. So everything, you know, whatever we charge, they get that right up front. Going, oh well, I didn't know a PM was that much. Yeah, you did. You got the sheet. You knew exactly how much that PM was. So that's another way to protect yourself. Just send, give your prices out up front and make sure they actually sign that credit card sheet. Don't let them send it back unsigned. Most of the time, if they if they don't accept it, they don't want to pay you. So right. you can just yeah. write that up, you know, like you're saving yourself uh, yeah. some heartache there. Uh, well, and, and, and when I left and I mean, when we made that decision in 99, there were no you couldn't take credit card on your phone. I mean, technology is so much better now that, you know, COD, and I think everybody understands. I mean, I tell everybody, if you, we sell very little equipment. It just happens to be on a whim, but it is, you got to pay me up front for the entire balance. And everybody seems yeah. to be okay with that because I'm like, manufacturer doesn't give me any terms. Like terms are dead. We just, they yeah. just don't exist anymore. And so when I just tell a customer that, you know, I'm like, you got to pay or you don't get it and they pay. So we so haven't that, really had any we were, collection issues. If we weren't set up with a corporate account, we wouldn't do service for them either. They're, they're actually the worst because if you don't go through their channels to get set up to get paid, you'll never get paid. So don't ever go to like one of the big, you know, corporate accounts just because they called you and you think you're going to get in there. It doesn't work. You'll never find your way through their accounting system to their, to their accountants to actually get a check. I would tell them, I know you can pay for things outside of your oh. process and I need a credit card to come out. Um, That's a great point. It's a great point. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times I got stuck on those. Yeah. I think I'm getting into something bigger. <laughs> well, I, well it, it, let's go to Jake and then, I'll, and then I have one last question and comment. Jake. Um, yeah, I would capture as much information on the customer you can before going, um, phone numbers, emails, you know, it multiples if you can. Cause I've, uh, I mean, we've usually rectified it, but we do a lot of service for hotels and, you know, last year we did work for a hotel and we're sending the invoice and it's automatically going, you know, on reminders. And I'm like, Hey, it's, you know, been 30 days. Um, and then we reach, I, I send an email directly to the email address we have on file. And they're like, oh, that guy no, no longer works here. So um, we've had some issues with that, but <clears throat> mostly it's just phone numbers. You, I find most bills get paid with a phone call. Um, <clears throat> like when you call them on the phone, they're like, oh, something that's going in my inbox. Or um, there's actually a person on the other end who's saying, hey, you need to pay me now. <laughs> um, but yeah. Can I add to your thing, Jake, with the sending the invoice and the emails? I always make my invoicer 
send the email directly from her email. We yep. do not send from any uh, invoicing system. So we download it to the computer, send it directly so we know if that person's no longer there. So just want to add that, sorry. <laughs> Uh, would you guys ever consider uh, carrying a square and having your text charging on site for COD? Caleb, you, 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 I think you did some of this. Would you, would you do that? Do you think it would be more efficient? Would you no, do it in a single I, tag? I, I don't, I, I like to keep that out of, so this was just my personal thing. And I think everybody can do this differently, but I liked keeping the, the collection out of the text hands as much as possible to keep that Barriers, so like they're to help, they're to help and like fix the equipment, and then the, you know there's this other side that collects the money. So we would do that internally, you know, in the shop, over the phone, uh, via email, somehow like that. I mean, yeah, occasionally techs had to grab a check or cash or something on site if if that was the case, but like for the most part, we did all the collections on the back end. Okay, thank you, Mark. You know, I think it's a great idea in theory. Um, again, I'm with Caleb. I just don't want to put my text in that position. I mean, as soon as tech leaves, we'll happily call and take the credit card um, right after that. Uh, again, if you do like a follow-up courtesy call to say, hey, the tech, everything good, he's there, time to pay your bill. Um, I wouldn't put that in the, I wouldn't put that on the tech's uh, shoulders um, to do that. They have enough just to get the calls done and I don't know, God forbid, do the paperwork right. Thank you. Kurt. Uh, I refuse to let the tax payment take payment at like credit card or decide the amount of the payment because I need to make sure that the company is earning every dime it's supposed to. So I it, I don't want to tech out there and I, I just don't want them going, oh, well, I feel a little bad I did this or that because I spent an hour and a half and it should only have been an hour. That's not their decision. That's the office's decision right. whether that should be billed or not. So that's my main reason. Let the people that do finance do finance. Let the people that do repairs do their repairs. And that, just keep them separate. Jake? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Just, it, I feel like it's kind of just an awkward experience to kind of nudge, like nudging people with your phone and be like, hey, you got to pay me right now. Uh, <laughs> but not only that, also how many times have you gone into a shop and you know the manager or whoever has the authority to pay you is not there? Um, I just, I, I feel like that would happen way too common though, just where it wouldn't work, even if you were going to do it. Yeah, I come from the days of the independence where you would walk in for a service and Mark might be able to, Mark, Mark, I remember this, where the owner would just hand you a pile of cash and say, yeah. I'm just going to pay you out of this. Like, <laughs> no. Those were great yeah. days, Island. Great days. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I have so, one customer who still does this. Yeah, like, yeah. a pile of cash. Um, so we've got, um, next two episodes next week is flow and this was an episode inspired by a question from you jake on jigglers and then the episode after that is dispatch 101 and communication and i actually like to invite this group back for dispatch 101 and communication if you guys are up for it i do think that we have sure. a lot to, you have a lot to offer as a group of different business owners um if you would like i left the slide up for the presentation we offer all of our presentations up for viewers um, gentlemen, do you have anything you want to close with before we wrap it up? Caleb? No, just thanks for uh, having me. This is a great conversation. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Kurt, how about you? Uh, just remember to have fun out there. Enjoy what you're doing. And remember, people really do appreciate you and depend on you. So That's they're thankful point, we're Kurt. here. Thank you. Jake? Um, trying to think. I think I'm good. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go have fun fixing your coffee machines. <laughs> Mark, how about you? Um, again, don't do it for the money, but if you are going to do it, I mean, it's it's been a really rewarding career. I've met a lot of people. Can't wait till the SCA show in New Orleans. I'm going to see people I've known for 25 years. You know, those, I mean, those are good times. So, um, and also the final one is like any job you should have. I mean, go out and take pride in your work and do the best you can do. And you'll always be rewarded with, you know, personal gratification and long-term customers. It always amazes me that coffee is literally one of the largest industries on the planet. Yet we're one of the smallest in terms of friendliness, in terms of customer familiarity industries I've ever seen. Like you can take, we've got friends all over the world that we'll see at, at 
Expo that we've known for 25 years, yet we're running, we're the machine of the world with caffeine. And it just blows me away how intimate we are with our friends and our associates. So gentlemen, I will see you at Dispatch 101 and drive you crazy with getting the PowerPoint ready. I wanna thank you all <laughs> and your organizations for giving me the time and giving the coffee technicians you'll the time, your time and your information and have a great weekend. Enjoy yourselves. All and right. Viewers, the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.